Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is Nancy Stolman. She's an award-winning author, performer, and all-around rabble-rouser. and uh, Or so she calls herself. I haven't seen any of that rabble-rousing yet, but we've got a whole podcast ahead, so she may you know, raise a little hell during this podcast. I don't know, but I will tell you that I've seen some of her videos on YouTube. And she is a performer for sure, and I mean that in the good sense of the word. Her book, Going Short, uh, An Invitation to Flash Fiction, uh, was published in 2020. It won a 2021 Reader Views Gold Award and is forthcoming as an audiobook uh, this year. Uh, I should have said right from the start that we're going to talk about flash fiction. Now, I've known about flash fiction for years, but I've only known it in name. I don't really know exactly what it's about. Clearly, it's a short form of fiction, but there's much more to flash fiction than that. But So we're going to talk to one of the experts on the subject and, and Nancy Stolman. Her um, other books, by the way, include After the Rapture, also Madame Velvet's Cabaret of Oddities, and The Vixen Scream and Other Bible Stories, among others. You can tell she's a, a, an interesting woman. Uh, her work has been anthologized widely. It's appeared uh, in the Norton Anthology uh, called New Micro, Exceptionally Short Fiction uh, is the, the title, and then also The Best Small Fictions 2019. Uh, and it's also been adapted for both stage and screen. She teaches at the University of Colorado Boulder. What a great place to live out, Boulder, Colorado. And she also teaches around the world because she does things virtually as well, like we all do these days. Nancy, uh, welcome to Novelist Spotlight. Thanks so much. It's fun to be here. You know, I, did I get anything wrong in, in the intro? I know I probably stumbled over a couple of things, no, but you anything you need to correct or emphasize or, uh, okay. Well, the and, only and thing... You the only yeah, thing I would say is that the audiobook has now been released. So it came out just yeah, about cool. six weeks ago. So it is now on Audible and out in the world making friends. Are you the reader? I am the reader, okay. which is really well, excited. Yeah. I mean, you've got a great voice. Uh, you come across really well. You come across really well in video, too. I will also tell our listeners that uh, Nancy's uh, URL will be in the episode notes. Uh, it is in the episode notes down below. So if you'd like to contact Nancy, learn more about her, what have you. But in this next 45 minutes to an hour, you're going to learn lots about her and about flash fiction. So Nancy, let's start with that whole question about what exactly is flash fiction. Uh, what would you, just in terms of definition, uh, uh, what is it? And what kind of word count qualifies as flash fiction? Yeah, that's the that's the first question. That's the appropriate place to begin. And actually, in the book, uh, in the book going short, that's right where I start. Um, so the official technical definition of flash fiction would really have two elements. One is that it is under a thousand words. That's the generally um, accepted upper word count, and the other, which is a little bit more tricky, is that it tells a story. So just because you have written something that might be under a thousand words doesn't necessarily mean it's a flash fiction, doesn't necessarily mean that it's telling a story. So those are really the two litmus tests on whether or not you're writing flash fiction. So is it begin beginning, middle, and end? I mean, is that part of what, uh, just like any story, the structure needs to have a beginning, middle, and end? It, well, and you're I just mean, doing no. It in yes and no. Yeah, you can do kind of a traditional beginning, middle, and end. And I've seen that done well and wonderfully, and I've done it myself. Um, so that's certainly one way to go about it. But what's been interesting about working with flash fiction and working with lots and lots of writers who are playing with flash fiction is that the form itself um, encourages you to play. The form itself actually kind of opens up this question mark. How can I tell this story in less than a thousand words? Should I start at the beginning and go to the end? Or should I begin at the end and go back to the beginning? Or should I begin in the middle and then you know bleed out? 
or or any number of ways. So absolutely, I think for me, uh, all that matters is that it works. So if you can get a story told in a thousand words, uh, I delight in the experimentation that happens with that. Okay, let's say I write a piece of flash fiction, but I'm not telling a story. It's not a beginning, middle, and end. Is the purpose of my writing that to, or for the purpose of somebody reading it, maybe is more to the point, or is it the artistry of wordplay? Is it characterization? I mean, what do you look for in flash fiction other than a story, or maybe not a story at all, but are you looking for the razzle-dazzle of the artistic writer? I mean, that certainly writer. can be a part of it, but I think it's still telling a story. So I think that we're still looking for that like gut punch, you know, we're still looking for, um, and what I would define story is not so much um, beginning, middle and end, but like, is there movement here? You know, did we begin in one place and and transform to another place? Did something resolve? Did something crack open? Did something shift? So, um, you know- So looking for an arc then of some mm -hmm. sort. Yeah. But a very a very fast uh, take on it. It can be a very fast take on it. Sometimes I've seen writers actually do kind of fun things with the arc where they will maybe come in right after the arc and let most of the story be implied. So there can there can be a lot of implication being used when you're telling a story in that small of a space because you don't have the time to explain every little thing. So you're really mm. relying on the reader to fill in a lot. And so it's it's a little bit of like a a, a push-pull with the reader where we're sort of giving enough clues that the reader fills in all those words that I don't have to say, you know, and then another big chunk of clues so that they fill in all these that I don't have to say. And I've seen really cool stories told um, where, you know, we kind of begin in the moment after what we would call the traditional arc and we can imply everything that just happened, you know. Well, you know, so let me posit something here, just as when we were in school, in elementary school, we are, so many of us got smothered by all the rules and regulations about the English language, uh, which killed a, a lot of our adventuresome <laughs> spirit because we were graded on infractions rather than our imagination and our spirit mm, and our adventure, our, our, our sense of adventure. Uh, the person who has decided, I do like to write, and I like to write fiction, but a novel is just, it's a huge project. Uh, it's hard to gather it all together and keep it on course. It's, um, and even short stories come with all these rules, for instance, beginning, middle, and end, and so on. Flash fiction is the the way out for a person like that, where you can enjoy writing fiction, but you can do it in short enough form that you see kind of instant gratification and, and not so many rules and regulations. I would say yes or would and you, no. Or would you take on bridge to that? Okay. Yeah, no, I'd say yes and no. I would say, you know, one of the um, myths, uh, one of the myths of flash fiction is that it's easy right? It's short, so it's easy, right? Um, it's a great starting place for a writer to like get warmed up into something more difficult and more important. And I really feel the opposite. I feel like flash fiction is a sophistication of some of these other forms. So for me, um, to jump right in as a brand new writer into flash fiction, maybe that works, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't look at it as I don't have the stamina for a quote real novel. <laughs> so I'll do flash fiction. It'll be much easier. It's not easier. And it's not the lazy man's or no, lazy woman's no, no. way to write, is it? No. And I have a, I, I'm always reminded of this at, at CU Boulder because I'll have students come to me with their scholarship essays. They're, you know, applying to grad school, that sort of thing. And and they'll say, well, there was a choice. They said we could either write a thousand word essay about our hopes and dreams or whatever, or we could write a 250 word essay about our hopes and dreams. So of course I went with the 250 word essay and now I'm completely stuck because how do I say all that in 250 words? So for me, 
it's really about the sophistication of being able to distill a lot of information into really poignant and necessary words yes. and sentences. So a bit like poetry in that way. Yeah, like poetry. And also one of the things, well, one of the the big mistakes fiction writers make, and I think this is really prevalent, is that they don't trust their reader. They don't trust their reader to understand what they're telling them. So they over-describe or over-explain everything. Mm -hmm. When in fact, if you, and, you know, if you write it well, if you if you know how to write the language in a compact way and make it full of meaning, few words full of meaning, then the the message is delivered, and you have to trust that your reader has a level of sophistication commensurate with anybody who reads fiction uh, or certainly literature, because uh, they wouldn't be reading it if they didn't have a certain level of sophistication. Absolutely, and that's another one of the misnomers that people who don't write flash fiction is there, they'll they'll think, oh well, you know what, everybody has short attention spans anyway, so no wonder people like flash fiction. And you know, if that were the case, then everybody would be reading poetry, <laughs> but they're not. So. Um, no, or you're flash right. fiction compendiums would be number one on the New York Times bestseller exactly. list at all times. Exactly, and instead, sometimes you know, very you know, you know, what do they call them? Door stoppers are sometimes mm -hmm. at the top of the list. You know, they people love a thousand word novel if it's really well written. It's and I said this in a recent podcast that a really good book is, um, and this is really a little bit of the opposite of flash fiction. Although you write collections of flash fiction, so a collection of flash fiction could could be a thousand pages for that matter. But the idea being, and I'm struggling not to lose my train of thought here, the idea being that um, you have a relationship with a good with a good piece of literature, a good book, and you don't want it to end. It's like a, a relationship with a, with a, a, a woman in my case, or perhaps or in any significant other um, would be that uh, you want that relationship to be sustained, just like a good book. Uh, you mm -hmm. don't want to just give it up quickly. What is a shortish piece of fiction, flash fiction you've written in terms of word count? Do you know? Um, I've certainly written flashes that are six words, one sentence, or you know, under ten words, definitely. Um, and I love your, I love your metaphor of the relationship because I think. All writing is relationship, absolutely. And, and if I were to put flash fiction into that metaphor, I would say, uh, versus a thousand page novel, let's say, um, the thousand page novel is the long term relationship, you know, that's the, that's the one that you're going to spend decades with. The flash fiction relationship is one of those hot and fast and amazing Three day relationships that you never <laughs> see that stand, person right? again. <laughs> well, one night stand has a sort of I know it's got you know, pejorative implications. Right. Yeah. But I mean that holiday romance where you spend forty eight hours with somebody, you never see them again, but you you think about them for the rest of your life. Yeah, you know, it sort exactly. of has that exactly. juice to it because I think when we're reading a novel, there's ups and downs in the novel, but we're often like driving towards that one or two, you know, gasping moments that are going to haunt us. In flash fiction, you get that gasping, haunting moment within five minutes. And this is why I can't read flash fiction be before I go to bed, because it just like wakes me up and then I'm just- Burns like, too wow. hot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I love how you picked up on that metaphor and you're so right about, uh, we all have met people in our lives, when, whether we had a, a truly a, 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 an intimate relationship with them or not, that we remember forever. So when you are writing a piece of flash fiction, where does that, what I'm really asking is, what, what are you looking for? What, are, what is your canvas? What is your, mm -hmm. if you were in a painter, you might be an impressionist or you might be a modernist or whatever. As a flash fiction writer, uh, can you uh, uh, categorize yourself at all? Mm. Hmm. I'll take a long route to that answer, I think. Okay. Um, I, I think for me, I've been writing flash fiction for so long now that most of my ideas arrive as flash fiction. It would be like a poet. If you were a poet, your ideas would arrive to you in 
poetic form. You know, you would be unlikely to see something and then suddenly like have an entire novel. Um, if you're a novelist, you're going to see the world as a novelist. Um, so my ideas pretty much arrive to me as slash fiction now. And I see them, you know, almost as like snapshots, you know, but, but not just, not just pretty snapshots, not just, you know, let me wax on about a beautiful sky, which, which might make a really great poem or might make a, a beautiful um, vignette or character study or setting or whatever. But for me, the fragments have to have that action, that movement. Uh, I will often tell my students to think about a story that they want to tell or a story that struck them and then narrow in on the most important five minutes of the whole thing. So, it, you know, if you're thinking even about the 48 hour holiday romance, let's say, um, the flash fiction piece might be the most important, poignant, charged five minutes of that whole encounter. And what would that be? And so for me, I don't need to do the setup. I don't need to tell you, you know, when I saw them, you know, I can do that. But um, but for me, if I just go right to the most important five minutes, I'm again, allow, I'm trusting my reader to know, well, I must have met them, you know, I must, whatever's going on. Um, a lot of that can be implied. And yes. when you don't have a lot of room, then you get right to what is your message and you let them fill in the rest. You know, you give them enough clues to let them fill in the rest, you know, um, yeah, there, there's, you know, words are freighted with, and phrases are freighted with meaning. Mm -hmm. If if you're a good writer, and if you learn to write in that particular way, and by compressing the, the, um, really the word count, you you have no choice. I love this phrase you use. You call flash fiction, and I'm quoting right here, a literary dehydrator, <laughs> leaving the meat without the fat. Yep. Yep. I That's mean, that really it. says it in. When you were talking earlier, I was thinking of the, I, I think it's attributed to Mark Twain, although I don't know if he actually said it about, I'm sorry for the length of this letter, but I didn't have time to write a short one mm -hmm. because it's harder to write a short than it is long. Yep. yep. As your students found out when they reached for the 250 word count rather than the thousand word count talking exactly. about their. Exactly. Yeah. How did you come across flash fiction? I mean, when did you discover that it existed and um, why does it, appeals so much to you versus mm -hmm. other forms? Um, I discovered it in grad school. So I was in grad school. So this would have been about 2007. And up until that point, I had considered myself a novelist. So I've always been a storyteller. Um, and I love novels. I read novels. I continue to read novels. Um, but and only so in flashes. I was, yeah. So I was <laughs> writing novels, right? And I had written a couple of novels at that point, all of them, what I would call my practice novels, which if you're out there listening, yes, you will have to write a practice novel or two. Uh, but uh, so I had written several practice novels and, you know, was just really on this uh, journey of writing novels. I thought that writing a novel was the stamp of approval, you know, writing and publishing a novel was the, the ultimate goal for a writer. So I was in grad school and um, I'd heard of flash fiction just sort of in my periphery and a class was offered on flash fiction. So I took it and it just rocked my world. And it didn't just rock my world in the class, but it made me really rethink even what I was doing with the novel that I had been working on at that time, which as most novelists do, you're trying to kind of hit a 60,000 word at least finish line in order to call it a quote novel and have people take you seriously. So I was saying a lot of things that were boring and didn't matter. <laughs> and I was writing a lot of that, what I'd call connective tissue, you know, between yes. good idea and good idea. And then you have to write all this connective tissue. And it really made me go back to that book and say, well, what if I took out all the boring stuff, like took out all the connective tissue, took out everything that wasn't really charged and, and really, you know, the best kernels, the best nuggets. What if I took it all out and just saw what was left? And of course, what was left was about half as long of a book, but it was half as long and, 
and suddenly very tight. Like suddenly, you know, there was tension on every page. Suddenly it was, you know, this distilled essence of what I'd been trying to say in twice as many words because I thought I had to do it that way. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, almost, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I almost uh, like to make the comparison of, you know, a, a, a vase full of flowers, right? A, a vase of roses. So you could have you know, a dozen roses or two dozen roses, and that can be, you know, beautiful and overwhelming. Or you can have just one perfect rose in a vase with nothing else around it, with lots of white space around it, and you see it differently. So, you know, 25 roses is beautiful, but are you seeing any one of those roses as a unique individual? Perhaps mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Or one rose in which you actually start to look at the petals, you know, and you start to actually take in the shape. One's not better than the other. They're just different. Right. And, you know, it, what pops to mind is the woman who loves the solitaire diamond because she doesn't want the distraction of a bunch of uh, little fragments of diamonds or, or crustaceans of diamonds around it because it detracts from looking at the solitaire, but from looking at the diamond, the, the, the primary diamond in its setting uh, solo. The simplicity of it is part of the beauty and also um, all the, the, the color it throws off, the facets and so on. Uh, but, but a lot of women like, you know, just encrust the, that that uh, that ring with lots of diamond chips. I mean, it's it's an analogy mm -hmm. that, that I'm using there. But um, uh, the other thing that you have said about flash fiction is that it's changing the way we tell stories. I'm going to ask you to elaborate on that, but I, I don't want to let what you just said go by before kind of jumping on board with that whole thing that one of the one of the issues for me when I read novels is those first 25 or 50 pages tend to be really well written. Those are the pages that they send to the agent to try to ca capture the agent's attention. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, to capture the editor's attention. But so often a novel really slumps in the middle or this, it, it's great for the first half of the book and then it falls off dramatically or you, you can feel that they rush to the ending. It's kind of like, okay, I'm up to 400 pages. Let's just close this thing down. And there's this headlong rush to a finish, um, which completely screws up the pacing mm -hmm. in, in any of those cases. So I like this idea that uh, what you're talking about, let's just take out all the connective tissue, the boring stuff. I mean, there's obviously going to be some connective tissue in there, but take out the stuff that is really filler where we're trying to get up to the, you know, 300 to 350 word count. So that it's like, okay, now it's a bona fide novel. Mm -hmm. Really? Is it? Or did we just um, sit there typing? And there right. are there are some famous novelists who've been accused of putting out some books where it's kind of like, this is just typing. It's mm -hmm. not really telling the story. Well, and I think too, it, I mean, it's not, back to what you had said about trusting the reader too. I think that um, we've been taught as early writers, you know, to slow down and describe everything, you know, every yeah. smell, every sound, every sight. Um, and I think that's a really great and useful practice to do in life, you know, just being really attuned to all the little details. But be, but then we become attached and we think that the reader needs every single one of those details or they're going to be somehow lost and they really don't, you know, you can really jump from one to another thing and not give any connective tissue. And the reader is just going to jump with you. You know, if you think about the way that movies are often spliced together, you know, we, we jump from one character scene action just in two seconds to another. And we're not suddenly like, wait a minute, we didn't get in the car and drive to this <laughs> other location. I'm confused. You know, uh, we just, we just go with it. We know that there's filler in there that wasn't important. And exactly. And yet, it, and in fact, those movies are better. I, they're not only, I mean, they're easier to watch. They're better made. If anything, uh, it's kind of like what isn't said is so important to a good script. And when mm -hmm. I'm watching a movie, it's kind of like, why, why did that person have to respond? The, the, uh, the uh, comment that was made before or the question that was posed said it all. So then you put this superfluous response, which makes it feel a little amateurish, Mm -hmm. instead of just going with it, like very much like what you're talking about. We don't need to see the person drive to the next location. Just put them there, materialize them, because we understand how people 
get around. We understand locomotion. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that I love about writing flash fiction is that play with white space and that play with what isn't said and all of the things I don't write, I think are still kind of haunting the text, you know, that the reader's filling them in, that they're not only filling in description and filling in, you know, location swaps and all of this sort of thing, but they're also filling in some of the implications of it. So it it really requires a sophisticated reader, which is another reason why I, I dismiss people who say that flash fiction is you know good for beginners, because I think it requires a you can't just passively potato chip eat flash fiction. You've got to actually be paying attention. <laughs> It's some, yeah, there's some effort involved in it. It's not, um, you know, because your your typical genre paperback is very easy reading, but it's it's a lot of what you're talking about, place to place, and a lot of connective tissue and a lot of description of things that don't really, that aren't really required. Let's get back to that quote I read from you earlier. You say, flash fiction is changing the way we tell stories. Now, I think some of the stuff you've said has has already illuminated on that, but uh, I want to kind of throw that in your lap again and just ask you to go ahead and give us the, the, you know, you're in the classroom and you're going to tell your students how flash fiction is changing storytelling. What do you say? Well, I think, yeah, back to what we had said at the beginning, there's there's suddenly um, a willingness to relook at that beginning, middle and end, or to relook at that classic story arc, you know, where we're kind of just going up and up and up the roller coaster. Um there's a willingness to experiment wildly with flash pieces because, you know, it, it, it almost becomes like a, like a circus act in some ways. And one of the things I see people do a lot and that I do as well, and, and that's um, works for flash fiction because it's flash fiction is we can write stories in, you know, borrowed forms in found forms um, such as, writing a flash story in the form of um, a cease and desist letter. You know, the, the cease and desist letter can be the entire flash fiction piece, you know, and so holding that form, putting our own content in it, we now imply an entire plot that we don't have to spell out from beginning to end, let's say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why do you love Tom Waits? You love Tom <laughs> Waits. And... Um, and uh, what is it about him and that, that as it relates to, uh, I believe this relates to writing for you as well. Is that mm-hmm. the, is it, cause he's a writer. He, Tom yes, Waits is a writer I would say well. he's a writer and um, Oh, Tom Waits, Tom Waits is one of these. I, I wasn't expecting this question. I love it. Um, so for me, Tom Waits and other artists like Tom Waits are really good at a lot of things, you know? And I think that sometimes an artist of of any genre becomes good at something and then they just keep doing that thing, you know? And they keep rehashing that thing. And then you just, you know, they release more albums like that thing. They keep painting that same thing, you know? Whatever it may be, they keep writing that same story. And what I love about Tom Waits is the way he continues to reinvent himself and each reinvention is wildly different than the one before, radically different, and is also awesome, you know, which I think is hard to do. And yeah. I think that's why artists don't like to take that risk, because if they've done something well and people recognize it as you know something that's good, they're afraid, well, if I try something wildly different and it's bad, then what happens? So I respect any writer who continues to reinvent themselves, but I am particularly enamored with writers who continue to reinvent themselves and keep doing it well, who keep having, you know, Picasso had many periods and each one of them is brilliant and beautiful in its own way. And for me as an artist who intends to be an artist until I drop, um, I've got a lot of years ahead of me and I better be willing to risk even even as I, you know, consider myself an expert in one field, I need to be willing to continue to take those creative risks, or I can end up just in my own, you know, my own bubble world and not really growing. So yeah. I, I love watching artists grow. 
I agree with you. And I, that's when you see really true brilliance, when you see a person re reinvent themselves in a way that's, especially when they're successful with it or reinventing because they just choose to express their art differently. They do it for themselves. But you have to know that uh, if you're commercially successful and you want to reinvent yourself, you're going to have a manager and a publishing company and probably a lawyer and a lot of other people pushing back against you saying, wait a minute, you're really, you're successful at what you're doing. Why do you want to change? Don't do that. Think of your audience and so on and so forth. Uh, it, you kind of become institutionalized in that way. And a lot of people um, either don't have the courage, don't have the chops, or they've been talked out of it by people around them who are kind of like, geez, I'm making good money, getting my 15% as your manager. They never, of course, express it that way. <laughs> I don't want you to change because, you know, your elms will be bought whether even though you've run out of gas in this particular channel, just go ahead and keep doing it because people will buy it, even, even though you're kind of sinking along the way, um, which often happens, often happens. People, you know, there's, if you don't change, I mean, what it was it, Kingsley Amos said, the only sign of life is change. Absolutely. Um, and that's it. And I think you have no... Oh, go ahead. Please. I was going to say, I think if we look back, you know, throughout history, some of the greatest pieces of art came when people went ahead and changed anyway. So um, all the way back to Beethoven, who was, you know, ridiculed for putting a choir in the Ninth Symphony, you know, which is now considered his one of his greatest masterpieces. Um, you know, people were just appalled that there was now a choir in the middle of a symphony or, you know, Bob Dylan who went electric and all his folk fans just thought he had betrayed music and everything, you know, worth fighting for. Um, so I think courage, I, I like the word you use there. I think it takes courage. And uh, obviously I wouldn't tell somebody money doesn't matter because money is, you know, the, the currency of how we exist here. But um I think we have to remember that it's not the only thing that matters. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think of Taylor Swift as somebody who, you know, there she was a country singer and then she went to a different genre and they said, are you not, are you concerned that you're going to alienate your fans, that your fans aren't going to be there? And she goes, no, uh, not at all, because it's always about the words. They, I, I sing to them about my life and their lives and I'm still going to be doing that. It's just not going to be country anymore. It's going to be more folk uh, or what have you. So, and I love she her. did it with a lot of yeah. And you know, she she's got she's one of those people who's got such a loyal following. She really doesn't have to worry about evolving over time. And that's what I consider it as evolving. Uh, you certainly want to do that. And I look to the Beatles as a as a band mm -hmm. musically. That boy, they start off with "I want to hold your hand," and then by the time they got to "Rubber Soul," it was really very different. Then they get the Revolver, and it starts getting kind of like this sounds like an acid trip a little bit. And then it got it got more acidic uh, along the way at times uh, with the White Album, certainly, and so on. So um, it's uh, those are the people who really do make history. Absolutely. And in just, what 10, about in just 10 years of, of creating artifacts, the Beatles have left us a, a huge array of work rather than just like 17 different versions of I Want to Hold Your Hand. You know? I bring up all the time. I'm so glad you brought that up because I say all the time that the Beatles only were together for 10 years and they created this immense body of work and they never had a bad album. And um, the best thing the band ever did was break up because it made them, they, it created a legacy that could they could never have put out an album years later that could have lived up to the legend. It just wouldn't have happened. And they must have known that. And they went off in, in their other creative directions and made great music. I mean, I love John Lennon's solo stuff. I love Paul mm -hmm. McCartney's solo stuff and all of them, really. You have notebooks that you fill with <laughs> writing. I do. Um, talk about your notebooks, what the purpose is and what goes in them. Oh, yes. So I am an avid journaler, avid journaler. And for those of you who are journalers out there, you're going to just be nodding your head. For those of you who aren't journalers, you're going to want to fast forward. Um, so I get it. But I really think that every one of my best ideas always comes to me through the journal. And part of that is because you know, you're doing it in a different way. There's this sitting in front of the computer with the cursor blinking at you in Times New Roman. And there's a, for me, there can be a real pressure there. 
But when I'm sitting down in my journal and I'm often in bed or on the balcony or at the pool or in any number of places, but never at my desk, um, it's like I'm just softer and I'm just playing. And so in the midst of the play, these really good ideas show up in the notebooks. And of course, the notebooks are also full of my daily, you know, dribble and, you know, plenty of things that would be extremely boring to read. But I know as I'm writing when I'm hitting a good idea, and then I just put a big star at the top of the page so I can find that page later. And then I just go for it. And then I just write it out by hand. Everything I write is written by hand first. And, and then if it still feels at the end, that it's got some juice, then I type it up. And in that typing up process, I'm actually doing kind of an initial cleanup edit of it. So uh, for me, it's a crucial part of my practice. I, I can't imagine not writing anymore. And you can imagine that I have many, many notebooks, many hundreds of notebooks. Um, I probably fill. So this is a daily practice. Daily, a daily practice. Daily practice, and it keeps you. It keeps you. So you build, and I've used this term on the podcast before: building momentum. Because mm -hmm. you're doing it daily, you're building that momentum up. And um, you say play. I like that you say play. This is a. This is what Ray Bradbury kind of talks about too. Sometimes back back uh, when uh, God rest his soul, um, but. When you play, you take the pressure off. Is that part of what works for you? Is you take the pressure off, you're not sitting down and saying, I'm going to write a story now, or I'm going to write a piece of really good flash fiction. Uh, but by playing with the language, do you feel less of a sense of pressure? Or do you never feel pressure when you write? Are you one of those exceptional people? Oh, no, no, I'm not exceptional. Um, and yeah, I think it's this idea of like, Nobody reads my notebook. Nobody's going to see it. If it if it bombs whatever I'm writing, nobody sees it. You know, it's it's not out there for the world. So, it's like the critic, the judge, you know, the judge and jury that sit on our shoulders so often when we're writing is just sort of dismissed at that time. And when I'm in my journal, it's it's very much like a meditation like a meditative practice or like stretching in the morning, you know, for me it's just kind of the way that I warm up my brain and kind of uh, poke around and see what's present for me that day, what emotions are kind of rising to the surface, what, you know, images or stories I might be ruminating over. And then sometimes in the middle of that, just a wild idea comes through the back door. I think when, when we're occupied elsewhere, these wild ideas can show up through the back door. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think of it as, a, as a, like a place where I play and warm up and, and where I stay warm, because I think sometimes I'll, I'll compare it to like an athlete, you know, you can't just go out on the field and, you know, kick butt. You've got to do it every day, a little bit all the time, failing most of those days, um, doing it for practice and not for real most of the time in order to be really in shape and ready to do it for quote real. And to me, that's what the notebooks are doing. That's it's my rehearsal. It's my practice. It's my play. And most of the time the ideas will come there. So the back door wild idea comes to the back door. So you keep yourself in fighting shape. And then I heard you say at one point, something to the effect of the story actually chooses the appropriate author. It's, it's out there in the ether or it's out there on the astral plane in it. And I, these are my words, not yours right now, but you, that story then finds Nancy Stolman. If mm -hmm. you're the appropriate channel and the appropriate artist to tell the story, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Did I get that right? First of all, Yep, you did. And that's not a brand new idea for me. Actually, I heard Tom Waits even talking about this at one point that, uh -huh. you know, he'd be driving and the story would like arrive and he's like, I'm driving. I can't write it down right now. Go find somebody else. You know? um, and uh, so, yeah. And, and I like that posture. I know it's kind of esoteric and all of that, but I really like this posture that we are not the genius 
ourselves, but that we are the midwives of the story. So we are the helper of the story. The story shows up. And if we are in shape and ready and have our hands free, not on the wheel, then we get to be the one to harness that into the world. Um, and, and I think that that keeps us humble, but it also helps with writer's block and that sort of thing too, because I think if we're always like, I'm the genius, I don't have any good ideas, um, that can be really discouraging. But I think if we remember like all the good ideas are out floating around in the world and you just have to sit down in your chair and be ready to, to receive them, uh, I think it takes a lot of pressure off. It's it's almost like having a cat. I don't know if there's cat owners out there, but it's like if if you want the cat to sit in your lap, the cat is not going to sit in your lap. But <laughs> if you pretend that you kind of don't want the cat to sit in your lap, but you sit down anyway, you're much more likely to have a cat in your lap. Yes, it's the power, the rules of attraction, isn't it? Certainly mm-hmm. with the with felines anyway. Uh, how interesting, because I was going to say that you sound spiritual in your approach and when you talk about, um, you know, it's a lot of people think of themselves when you talk about humility and you talk about taking the pressure off. And if you kind of approach it from the from the standpoint of I'm a channel or I'm a vessel or I'm the delivery system, I'm the midwife. It's out there. It's going to come to me. It's not me. It's the great unconscious. It's the great, you know, the divine will or what have you. Uh, that can take a lot of pressure off and it can also keep, as you say, keep a person humble because it's, you know, everybody has access to this, but you've got to be prepared for it. You have to want this to happen and you need to prepare yourself for it. It sure sounds though, like um, when you talk about stories, it sounds like the old spiritual maxim, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. Mm, I like that. I hadn't put that together, but but, but yes. you, you sound spiritual. You mm-hmm. sound like a spiritual person. Is I, that the case? Yeah, I would say I am. And I would say that I look at my writing practice as a spiritual practice. Um, I'm always, you know, kicking myself that I'm not sitting down and meditating as my you know, teacher would tell me to do all the time, but I'm sitting down and journaling every day, you know? And so for me, my writing is a spiritual practice. And, and I think that that humility is not only in the stories arriving, but it also shows up over and over in the middle. You know, when you are pushing a story to do one thing and it really wants to do another thing, you know, or when you're like hammering at this one door because you, you've mapped it out already. And in your outline, this is what's going to happen. Um, when that's not working, it's usually because you're not listening to the story because the story is always smarter than we are, I think. And so I don't outline things. I don't, um, I try to stay as open-minded as possible when things are arriving and even when I'm revising them, because I do think that that the stories have more wisdom than we think they do. And when we try to control it and trying to get in there and uh, you know put put scaffolding all around it too soon, obviously at some point we have to do that. But when we when we try to do it too soon, I think we can we can kind of uh, kill an idea before it even gets a chance to fully blossom. So yeah, I would say it's a very um, mysterious process. So with your journaling, I think there's some people out there that might emulate the way you do it. And you've described it to some degree. Are you the kind of person who gets up in the morning and you journal right away? Is Julia Cameron's method of keep your hand moving and do the morning pages, three pages it, or is it not so much the number of words or phrases that you get down on in the notebook, but it's more just keeping your attention riveted to the to to the imagination and to and to what might come from the next you know the mm-hmm. other dimension? Um, it's it's a little of both. I definitely started journaling um, twenty five years ago after reading Julia Cameron's book, so I'm definitely a fan of her book, The Artist's Way and her morning pages. And I did her morning pages in the way that she described, you know, at first and for a long time. Now it's a little more fluid. I do them in the morning. um, But sometimes I do them also later, you know, I almost always journal in the morning, and I almost always do it with my coffee. So it's it's a little ritual for me. Um, I'll sit on the couch with my coffee, or I'll sit in bed with my coffee. 
And um, so the two things sort of go together for me, journaling and coffee. But uh, but I will often journal in other times of day, especially when I'm traveling and I do a lot of solo traveling. Um, I will write in my journal all day long. You know, every time I'm at a restaurant by myself, I'm writing in my journal. You know, every time I'm at an airport, I'm writing in my journal. And for me, the journal has almost become like a confidant. Like when I when there's nobody there to talk to, I write in my journal because I'm talking to the wisest part of myself. And I'm, I'm great company for myself. I think too many people um, dismiss their own company and go for the quick fix of the screen. The screen is just, you know, so easy at any screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and Absolutely. we lose that moment of like hanging out with ourselves. And then when I journal, I'm actually like conversing with myself. Well, and the truth is a lot of people can't be with themselves. They, they, they bridle at that. They've done experiments where they've asked a person to sit alone in a room where they didn't have a device. There were no magazines. There was no television. There was no nothing. And they were, were going crazy because they really kind of couldn't stand to be with themselves, which I think they would have benefited from, from actually doing more of that and, um, and just going ahead and, and, um, something like journaling probably would have connected them with their kind of their inner selves, so to speak. So how much time per day do you put into journal? I mean, mm-hmm. you do it sporadically if you're on the move and whatnot, but if you are just as a typical day at home, do you um, have a, any kind of time frame that you yeah, I adhere would say to? on average, I probably journal an hour a day, mostly in the morning. Um and it's it's sort of just the way I begin my day, and sometimes more, sometimes less, sometimes I've and it always if I've got my phone next to me and I like make the mistake of looking at it, all of a sudden, boom, I'm in the real world. You know, all of a sudden, like forget it, it's over. Uh, so I really try to keep my phone in the other room or turned off or far away from me so that I don't, um, so that I'm not tempted. And sometimes it's a it's a legitimate temptation. Maybe I'm writing about something and I'm like, oh, I wonder how many people have gone to the Grand Canyon this year, you know, and then I want to grab the phone and do that research and then boom, I'm out of the thought, you know? So, um, uh, so yeah, I would say on average about an hour a day can definitely be more. Um, certainly I could miss a day or two, but I probably don't miss more than three days before my family is like, you're a mess. Go please write. We can't stand being around you. (laughs) Um, Do you do writing sabbaticals? Is that? Mm -hmm. Talk about writing sabbaticals. What what do you try to accomplish with those? Both for myself and I run writing retreats for other people, which is just something I've been doing in the last few years. Um, I started myself. So I started just doing like a weekend in the Motel 6 because my thought was like, I'm here to write, not to explore my surroundings. So let's make the surroundings as uninteresting as possible. So um, so I did many, many weekends and I still do uh, a couple times a year, just a weekend in a non-interesting location where I can just wake up and go to sleep with my work on my mind and get to really dive deep and make sort of that that bubble container of magic. I do think giving yourself a retreat in any sort um, of sense is very magical and allows you to kind of go into places you can't usually access. So I've done that for years. Um, And then I started running with another writer, uh, Kathy Fish. We uh, started uh, flash fiction retreats and it was sort of an experiment back in 2017 and it has just grown. Now I run the business and Uh, I do a couple of retreats a year. I'm doing one in June in Spain, in the south of Spain. So I've got about uh, 10 people joining me in Spain in just a few weeks, actually. And uh, I'm doing one in Colorado at the end of August, big one. And so, so now I'm able to kind of make these spaces for other people as well to come. And that's a whole different thing. Um, But I also know how important it is for me to give those to myself. Cause when I'm running retreat, I'm not on retreat. I'm doing, I'm, I'm a teacher. And yeah. um, so I've given myself many retreats that are 10 days long. And even the longest I've been on is a three week one by myself. 
where I just went deep. And my book after the rapture, which is coming out next year, it's in like edits and all of that right now. Uh, I really kind of harnessed the ideas and, and really found the skeleton during that three weeks when I was on sabbatical by myself. And I don't know if I could have dug that deep if I hadn't given myself that. So uh, if anybody out there is thinking about it, I would say take three solid days if you can make make three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and just see how how deep your own rabbit hole can go and what kind of really um, interesting things can percolate when you sit in that chair for a long time. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, getting back to what you were saying about um, enjoying your own company, uh, Edward Abbey in his book, Desert Solitaire, I, I, I pilfered this out of it because I, I collect, you know, good good quotes from um, from novels. And he wrote, it is a paradox that a man can never find or need better companionship as for that of himself. And the the whole book is about him being a ranger in the in the um, um, I'm forgetting the name of the park right now in Utah, and uh, he was a guy who always loved the solitary confinement of the mind, which uh, is what he called it. Loved being alone uh, and loved to be among nature and the animals. And uh, but to your point, the idea that the best companionship you'll ever have is yourself. Yeah. And uh, and there you have it. Talk a little bit about I, I almost did you want to say something about that? No, I just wrote down I wrote that book the title down because I haven't read it. I've read other books. You will enjoy it very yeah. much, Doug, Desert Solitaire. It's a, it's just a, a Edward Abbey classic. Um I wanted to ask you if um well, here's a true or false question for you. True or false if I write a collection of flash fiction to try to get it published. My chances are far less than if I write a novel. Hmm. Again, because the industry doesn't respect it yet. Yeah, maybe. right. Um, I would say that's probably shifting, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, and again, I'm not the spokesperson of the publishing industry, so I can only speak to my instinct on that. But I think that, novels have traditionally made more money than short story collections and and flash fiction is certainly a new kid on the block so um i think that as a as a business which the publishing industry is a business it's a corporation and corporations want to make money um my instinct is that they are more likely to be excited about that which has made money in the past and less likely to take wild risks on things that feel less sure. That's sort of my instinct on it. Um, my agent, when she came on board with me about five years ago, seven years ago, uh, I was the first person that she'd ever represented with flash fiction. And she said straight out, she's like, I don't know how this is going to go. Uh, I don't know how people are going to respond. I've never done this before, but um, let's try it. Let's do it. You know. So I think flash fiction is still very much in the underground. It's it's peeking its head out in places, and I think once you're in the know, you realize how vast the underground is. But eventually, it's going to pop all the way to the surface. And eventually, um, Barnes and Noble is going to decide, you know, where they're going to shelve it and all of these sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. I just, yeah. I, I, I think if your goal is to make money, then, then write commercial fiction. That's been right. proven to make the most money. And if your goal is something else, then figure out what that is. Maybe journal about that in the morning, you know. Well, and that's the big question is, you know, do you write for yourself or you're writing for some audience out there? And some people do both. They they will. I heard this one guy um, talking on, on a on a podcast and he said that, uh, well, I won't say what name I write under because I want to keep that private. But I write romance books because it makes me money. But the stuff I really want to write, I write under my own name. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, you see that happen in the in the in the business uh for uh for for some people you know we should have you 
you have a forthcoming book you were just talking about. We should have you read something from that. Can you do that? Oh, Give sure. us a preview and read a little. Yeah. Well, you're finding uh, a piece uh, to read to us. Uh, talk about endings. What do you tell your students in terms of endings? Is that something you spend any time on where, where a student might say, how do I know when or how to end it? And and mm-hmm. what about open endings versus closed endings? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, endings are tough for people, I would say, in general, because I, I feel like people have a better grasp of like, a hooky, catchy opening. And then endings just seem like this wizardry magic. And they can't, you know, they, you can recognize a good ending, you can feel it. But how do I, you know, how do I emulate that? So in flash fiction, I will often suggest that people look for their ending somewhere in the middle of what they think is the story that we will often keep going further than we need it to. And that the Mm. ending is probably two thirds of the way in what you're calling the middle of the story right now. And what if you just chopped it off and just stopped right there at that poignant moment or at that like perfectly turned phrase rather than like go on six beats longer. So that's one of the first things that I do when I'm thinking about endings is I is I start from the end and I go backwards toward the beginning and I just start asking myself, like, could I end here? Could I stop here? Could I stop here? And very often I've already written like the perfect ending sentence. I just need to move it to the ending. And actually in After the Rapture, that's what I ended up doing for the whole book. I had the perfect ending piece, but it wasn't at the end. And so I ended up, when I moved it to the end, it just snapped into place. So I shot, um, yeah, I won't read the ending of it for you today, obviously, but I will read the opening, if you like. What's Uh, what's the title of this this one? The book is called After the Rapture, and this one, uh, I took off all the titles. So they're all flash fiction pieces, but none of them have titles anymore. But it, it has been published separately under the title, The Bad Thing. Got it. So here we go. Before the rapture, a bad thing happened, and the people were horrified, and they cried, and they played the details over and over like a particularly painful heartbreak. And someone decided that a memorial should be built, and everyone should wear red. And once a year, everyone wore red and remembered the bad thing, and it seemed right. The next time a bad thing happened, the people decided it was only fitting to designate another color, white this time. And people wore white, and some people wore red and white together to show how the two bad things were connected, and that also seemed right. But the bad things just kept happening. Soon the primary colors were gone, then the secondary colors... The newest tragedies were forced to come up with creative coloring like teal or lavender, and soon it expanded beyond colors. People in mourning for a specific tragedy could either wear the color or buy a bracelet made of that color, and some people had 10 to 15 bracelets going up their arm until it was pointed out that the bracelets weren't produced in an environmentally friendly manner, and then the people got rid of all the bracelets, and they tried to go back to the colors. But even the colors didn't work now, because every color was affiliated with a tragedy, and if you were wearing, say, lime green pants, but you didn't know which bad thing was being mourned in lime green, then you might be called a poser and accused of trivializing other people's suffering. And still the bad things increased until there were several bad things every week and new symbols had to be devised to express your horror, like praying hands and beating hearts and hugging arms you could send electronically or turn into magnetic magnetic bumper stickers for cars or bicycles, and you could also swap your electronic picture frame to one especially made to announce your devastation at the new bad thing. But sometimes another bad thing would happen on that very same day, and you wouldn't know if you should keep the original picture frame to mourn the first bad thing, or if you should update to mourn the most recent bad thing. And those who updated would be called insensitive, by the ones who had not yet finished mourning the first bad thing. It got to the point where the bad things had to compete with the other bad things. 
and a thing that would have been pretty bad back in the days of the primary colors was now almost ignored. And people abandoned the picture frames, but they didn't know which symbols to use now, which led them to create new symbols like baking cakes in the shapes of tragedies that needed to be mourned, and sometimes they traveled to the locations of the bad things just to feel the awfulness more acutely, and they became jumpy, like children in volatile households who are trying to read the signs and see the next bad thing approaching, and so sometimes they would see regular things as bad things and jump at the sight of prayer hands or beating hearts or hugging arms until they became numb and the bad things kept happening, but they were out of colors and they were out of ideas. And so eventually they did nothing. Wow. You know, the, the, the repetition, the, it's mesmerizing because you bring this repetition into the bad things and other bad things and more bad things and the colors. And there is a hypnotic effect mm, to your writing you. because it, 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 that, that repetition, which a lot of people will, they'll shrink away from something like that because you're never supposed to repeat anything. That's a p very powerful technique that you hear. Oh God, my, my God, Malcolm X used to, used to use repetition mm -hmm. of that, of, you know, you know, of that sort very, exclamatory uh, repetition to really do, do get an audience uh, jacked up. That was a beautiful piece of writing. Thank you. Where did that come from? I mean, did that come from your journal? And do, do you know, um, actually, before you even tell us that, is there any interpretation you would apply to that? Would you, mm -hmm. is it just, hey, it's your interpretation or mm -hmm. would you elaborate on that? Mm -hmm. I do like to leave it um generic in some ways, because I like people to sort of fill in what it means to them. But I wrote that in 2015. And at that time, it was like school shooting after school shooting after school shooting. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it like it came to me through my journal, of course, in a response to that. But what's happened since I wrote it is that it, it just applies to so many things, including, you know, a pandemic and, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter and the whole bit. I mean, you could put right. anything in there as the bad thing. And so I really enjoy knowing what it means to me, but also letting it be very malleable, that it can mean something different to somebody else and at another time and place. Nancy Stolman, this has been, you've been great. You're, you're a terrific uh, interview. This is really great information. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, and, and visiting with us and elaborating on flash fiction. Thank you so much. Thanks you for having be. me. I love just sitting and talking about writing with somebody else on this level. And I know that all your readers are, are people I probably could sit and have an hour long conversation with. So it's been a joy to be here. Thank you.